Wayne County declares an emergency as more snow falls and even more is expected around the state. You're right. <laughs> not, that's not looking good. Meanwhile, what made an already very cold day in Montevilla even worse. All eyes on the governor, who will need to pick a replacement for Secretary of State Dennis Richardson, who died after a battle with brain cancer. And there's now an island in the middle of California. See, the only way people can get into this flooded rural town. Plus, we verify whether there's any reason to worry about an online hoax urging children to harm themselves. And why a Lincoln City man is hauling his 85-pound black lab across the country on a bike. Here's the star of the show. KGW News at 6 starts now. And Oregon is looking at another round of snow by tomorrow morning. And one place that definitely does not need it is Lane County, where lots of folks have no power. The Portland metro area didn't avoid it either. PPS canceled school and places like Lake Oswego stayed cold and slick. Thank you for being with us. I'm Laurel Porter and I'm Dan Haggerty and we are not done yet. Not with this snow tomorrow morning. It could bring more snow, more ice. We of course have team coverage for you. Meteorologist Joe Ranieri. He is in Eugene. They've been buried under days of snow there, but we're going to start with KGW's Morgan Romero, who has a look now behind the roadblock into a town of Oak Ridge east of Eugene. Morgan, take it away. Well, the mountain town of Oak Ridge has been without power for three days now and the only road into town. It's still not fully open. ODOT says they have made good progress, clearing debris, snow and down trees off Highway 58. This video was shot today along Highway 58 before you get to Oak Ridge. You can see countless downed trees on the side of the highway. Crews work to clear the mess all day, but as you can see in this video, snow is still blocking some portions of the lanes. At 9 a.m. and 4 p.m., the Department of Transportation let drivers from Oak Ridge out to get food, supplies, whatever else they need. The final return trip is happening right now. Like I said, I've never been in a crisis like this in 30 some years, so you know, it's just, it's awful. It's lots of snow, and I can't wait till our power comes back on. It seems like to me, overage doesn't matter. Everybody's running out of food, freezing. We're heading out of town. I don't know what we're going to do. Red Cross opened a shelter at the junior senior high where there's heat, limited cots and meals and Lane County emergency services are filling propane tanks for free at a church in town. However, some are left feeling helpless, scrambling to stock up on supplies. Most people aren't even know, weren't sure how to prepare for this. It's just more than what we've been able to take on. It's 40 degrees in the house. We're cooking on a Butane, one burner butane, yeah. and we got like a half a can of butane left. People in town say this situation is helping bring their community together. It's not clear when Highway 58 will be open to regular traffic again or when power will be fully restored. But of course, we'll continue to stay on top of this and bring you updates on air and online on KGW.com. Wow, you get the sense people are starting to feel desperate there, Morgan. Yes. Thank you. All right, let's get to meteorologist Joe Ranieri now. He's live in Eugene. Uh, so they've had a few inches of snow there today already. They already had snow to deal with, and they're also worried about a power outage there. How long do they think residents are going to be without power there, Joe? Dan, it could be days before power is fully restored to customers throughout the Eugene Springfield area. And because of the widespread out outages that affect so many people and the widespread snow that covers much of this part of the Willamette Valley, Lane County, Lane County has issued an emergency declaration. Now that the snow is over, at least for now, Lane County is trying to dig out. Definitely an epic storm. I haven't seen this much snow around here in a long time, and I've lived here my whole life. so. This was a big storm. From Sunday to Monday, a foot of snow fell in Eugene. I like it. It's nice. Um, it's definitely different for sure. Um, I like remember like it was 12 a.m. and I'm like, oh, it's snowy. Like I can't wait to wake up in the morning. And then it was like 3 a.m. and I looked again and there's like a bunch more. And then last night, a couple more inches on top of that fell. It's definitely not something that we usually see here. I mean, if it does snow in town, maybe couple few inches at best. And because of the heavy snow, thousands were losing power across the Eugene Springfield area. A big part of the power outages has come from power lines that have been toppled over by trees and heavy snow. These photos were taken from Bonneville Power Administration that show some of the mess crews are working to clean up. Many Crestwell residents are still waiting for power. At this 76 station, people weren't just filling up on gas. Every day's a picnic now. Propane tanks were getting filled left and right. It's messy. 
It's very messy. It's very cold. Um, we're hopeful that power will come on soon. And uh, we're just thankful that these guys have propane to sell us. Dylan Davenport, who couldn't get out of his driveway until today, says they've had to request more deliveries just to fill the demand. Three hours straight right now for propane. You pumping more propane or more gas? Probably equal, probably equal. So we've had three deliveries in the last day for propane. Now people are just hoping the power comes back before seeing a chance at even more snow. Eugene police tell us at its central 911 call center, they typically handle about 400 calls a day. On Monday during the snowstorm that brought a foot of snow, they received over 1,000 911 calls. Back to you guys. Well, that is eye-opening. It's been such a difficult ordeal for so many people. Thank you, Joe. And in the Portland metro area, the snow caused several issues, too. In the Montevilla neighborhood, the power was out all day until just about an hour ago. We were handicapped because we didn't have any... <gasps> Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> wow, what a uh, That's a great feeling, isn't it? We were talking with Elizabeth Litster in her home when you saw there the lights came back on. The power went out about 4.30 this morning. Pacific Power says the weather most likely blew out one of its transformers. 4,500 people were in the dark at one point. I've been standing in the window looking outside and hopping up and down just to stay warm because there's nothing else you can do, right? And it's cold too. Portland Public Schools surprised a lot of folks by closing for the day, even though many people woke up to more snow on Monday and school was just delayed two hours then. The school district explained it was more concerned about the ice today. Let's get to Chief Meteorologist Matt Safino now. And Matt, you're talking some more snow tomorrow. Is it going to be anything like today? It'll be a little bit different than today in that the snow showers won't be the snow won't be a widespread general area of snow. A little bit of news for you though. Um, ODOT has reopened Highway 20 west of Santa Ana Pass. It was closed again for the second time this week because of avalanches. It has now been reopened. I saw a truck go by just a bit. It looked like it was a plow. So that's good news if you're planning on traveling Highway 20. But if you are planning on traveling Highway 20, the road is still really snowing. It's only 21 degrees up there, so still a bit rough in the Cascades. Now, the area of snow we have this morning is pushing out into the Cascades. Now, what we're now remember last night that all came straight up from the south and covered the valley. Now what we have is a more typical pattern with showers coming in from off the coast. Some of these for the valleys will be snow showers, so they're random. They're spotty. They can drop a quick half an inch or inch of snow in more isolated areas compared to what we saw last night. So we have to contend with that. And last little bit of light out at Astoria. It's just 36 degrees and there is snow on the ground even out at Astoria. So snow showers will increase here in town late tonight, probably 11 o'clock to midnight. We could get some quick accumulations, but generally above 500 feet, half an inch, maybe an inch. I think for tomorrow morning for the commute, for schools, all that, it should be a lot better and we'll turn to rain showers in the afternoon. Back to you. All right, Matt. Thank you so much. And you can stay up to date on the forecast. Everything Matt has to say, the weather warnings, download the KGW Portland weather app. It is free for all Apple and Android devices. Oregon Secretary of State Dennis Richardson died last night after a battle with brain cancer. In the coming weeks, Governor Kate Brown says she will pick his replacement. Richardson's death is a huge loss for Oregon. He was the only elected Republican in statewide office, and leaders across the state are paying their respects to Richardson and giving their best wishes to his family. Congressman Greg Walden called Richardson a kind, caring, and thoughtful friend and wonderful public servant. Senator Ron Wyden says he appreciated standing with him at services at the Oregon Fallen War Heroes Memorial in Central Point, something he says Richardson made possible. And State Attorney General Ellen Rosenblum said she's going to miss her check-in lunches with Richardson and said at their last get-together, he gave her a coin inscribed with his motto, reading, having been given much, what will you give in return? KGW's Pat Doris in Salem Forest tonight, getting some reaction from lawmakers and a look back at Dennis Richardson's career. Pat. Well, Dan, the Secretary of State earned a lot of respect here at the Capitol for the way that he treated people, the way that he tried to do things. He had considerable strength concealed in a quiet personality. Dennis Richardson revealed his inner strength in Vietnam as a combat helicopter pilot. He later moved to Southern Oregon to the town of Central Point. 
A devout Mormon, he and his wife Kathy raised a family of nine children, eight daughters and a son. By 2002, he was in Oregon's State House, rising over six terms to hold a powerful co-chair position on the Joint Ways and Means Committee. Former State Representative Julie Parrish was a fan. Loved him. <laughs> you know, you, you couldn't get a nicer, more genuine person than Dennis Richardson. In 2014, he tried to do what no one had in a generation, win the office of Oregon governor as a Republican. He lost to Democrat John Kitzhaber. I'll never forget interviewing him that night. He was at peace. As long as I've done my best, that's all I can do. And I've done the very best I can. And so if the voters don't elect me, there's nothing else I can do. And so I will rest peacefully tonight. I'm enjoying the time with my seven daughters that have come from all over the country to be here and nine grandkids. It's a great night for celebration. I remember watching him dance with his granddaughter seemingly without a care in the world. He dropped out of politics that night, but not for long. Two years later, he was back, convinced by Parrish and others that his state needed him. It took a while to get him to think about coming back, and eventually he did. In 2016, he became the first Republican elected Secretary of State in 30 years, and he pledged to serve all Oregonians. As the Secretary of State, I will be functioning as an Oregonian and it's my commitment that you will not know whether I have an R or a D behind my name. He made his mark with unflinching audits of state agencies. Republican House Leader Carl Wilson respected that. He knew so much about the budget. He knew where, he knew where all the bones were buried, and he knew how to find those and to talk about those. Then in 2018, Richardson announced online that he had brain cancer. He put up a positive image, but over time, his appearance changed as he underwent treatment and at times talking was difficult. Last night at home, back in Central Point, he died around 9 o'clock, surrounded by his loved ones. He was 69. His family has grown to 31 grandchildren. He will be remembered as a statesman who treated others with dignity and respect in the rough sport of politics. But I suspect his favorite description would be that he was a kind and loving husband, father, and grandfather. And the Deputy Secretary of State will run the office and the day-to-day -day affairs until the governor appoints a successor for Dennis Richardson. Back to you. He was a kind man, and he will be missed. Thank you, Pat. Richardson was first in line to succeed Governor Brown if she ever became unable to serve or if she was removed from office. But the replacement the governor appoints won't be. Oregon is one of five states without a lieutenant governor, so the secretary of state is next in line, followed by the state treasurer, then the president of the Senate, and then the speaker of the House. But since Governor Brown will be appointing Richardson's successor, that person will not be eligible to be governor if something were to happen to Kate Brown. The governor's successor cannot be someone in an appointed role. That means the Oregon state treasurer, Tobias Reed, will be the first in line to succeed Governor Brown until a Another Secretary of State is elected. A Washington nonprofit that sells bracelets to help fallen heroes is in trouble again. The Washington Attorney General warns the company is still harassing uh, customers even after a judge's warning. KGW investigative reporter Kylie Boshi first raised questions about this company last year after finding complaints from around the country. Kyle, we keep seeming to come back to this story. We do indeed. In the latest move, the Washington Attorney General sent the company a cease and desist letter. It outlines a series of complaints and suggests if the company doesn't clean up its act, the AG will have no choice but to go back to court and seek stiffer penalties. The website, FallenHeroBracelets.com, is still in business and still getting complaints, according to the Washington Attorney General. It comes a bit of surprise that it appears he's back at it again. Last week, the state AG sent a cease and desist letter to the company, warning it was in violation of a court order to stop harassing customers. Once a judge bangs that gavel and tells you, you must do X or you cannot do Y. If you violate that agreement, you're back in front of that judge and big penalties can accrue as a result of that. Judges don't mess around with this. So when someone called me to complain, a KGW investigation last May uncovered complaints from around the country about the Tacoma-based nonprofit. On its website, Fallen Hero Bracelets sold memorabilia to honor the U.S. military and pretended that sales went to help improve veterans' lives, according to the AG's office. Several customers yeah. told KGW they didn't get what they paid for. And when they complained, 
the company responded with vulgar emails and threatened to sue. It kept escalating the threats about lawsuits and everything. Greg Church of Billings, Montana, warns the company is still harassing customers, even after the injunction. He got this nasty message in mid-February. He's threatening to sue me for torturous interference. Uh, I'm a former police officer. He's threatening to sue me and my department. The Fallen Hero Bracelet's website no longer mentions charitable activities, and the company appears to be using a different name, Hudson Bay Trading Company. He can change his name. He can change the company's name. That's not going to make any difference. If the conduct that he's engaged in violates the terms of that injunction, he's got big problems. I reached out to the company and its owner for a comment. He didn't respond to me, but he did respond to the AG's office, arguing that he's not in violation of that injunction. So we'll see how things play out from here. Somehow I don't think this story is quite <laughs> over. <laughs> he's putting up a fight, that's for sure. Thank you, Kyle. Thanks, Kyle. And if you have an idea for Kyle to investigate, give him a call, 503-226-5041, or send him an email. Call Kyle at kgw.com. A scary online challenge urging kids to hurt themselves has some parents worried. We verify whether it's actually a hoax.